I almost don't want to preach. They did such a great job. That was, got us all lathered up. But uh, there is a word from the Lord on today. There, uh, I want to say this right before we get started. Tomorrow, tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m., there will be a homegoing service for our dear sister, Sister Barbara Redman. She uh, fought a good fight and was faithful till the end. It's going to be in Tappahannock on tomorrow at 11 a.m. And I think, uh, D, are, are we taking, are we going? Is the bus going? Did, did we get Deacon Rochelle? No. Okay, okay. So if you can't go, uh, send your prayers. Uh, 11 a.m. tomorrow, Beal Memorial Baptist Church in Tappahannock. I have been asked to eulogize Sister Redman, so I, I ask your prayers as we try to say something. It won't be hard to say something good about Barbara Redman. Amen. As a matter of fact, just because uh, she's our sister, can we just thank God for her life right here? Amen. Amen. We love you, Barbara. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we honor you. We thank you. We thank you for so many things, including the life of Barbara Redmond, who while here for such a short time was faithful and engaging and loving. We thank you, God, that you allowed her to come by this way for a while. Now, sir, for this your preach moment, I pray that you would give me preaching power. Build me up where I am weak. Pray, sir, that you do in me what I am not able to do for myself. The task before me is certainly too large for me, but I am convinced that with you, we can do all things through Christ Jesus. Thank you that we'll leave here differently than we came. For your word shall not return void. This is our prayer in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. The people of God said, Amen. Amen and amen. Travel with me, if you will, to the gospel according to Mark. The gospel according to Mark, second chapter, starting at the first verse. The gospel according to Mark, second chapter, starting at the first verse. Want to shout out the balcony this morning. Amen to all those folk hanging in the balcony. What's good? And to all those folk uh, watching us streaming live, we thank God for our cyber congregation as well. Amen. Amen. You might not know it, but people watch y'all every Sunday across this country and to some, to some extent the globe. I've had messages from the Orient, I'm not making it up, of folks saying that they watch us on Sunday morning. So we thank God for what God is doing with the gospel across the airwaves. Mark chapter 2, starting at verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Follow along wherever you may be. Several days later, Jesus returned to Capernaum and the news of his arrival spread quickly through the town. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for one more person, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't get to Jesus through the crowd, so they dug through the clay roof above his head. They lowered, then they lowered the sick man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My son, your, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there said to themselves, what? This is blasphemy. Who but God can forgive sins? Jesus knew what they were discussing among themselves, so he said to them, why do you think this blasphemy? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or get up, pick up your mat, and walk? I will prove that I am the son of man have the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up. 
take your mat and go on home because you are healed. The man jumped up, took the mat, and pushed his way through the stunned onlookers. Then they all praise God. Somebody say all. all. They all praise God. We've never seen anything like this before, they exclaimed. Watch this. Verse, verse 4 says, they couldn't get to Jesus through the crowd. So they dug through the clay roof above his head. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. For the few moments that I always like to talk to you from the thought, just do it. Just do it. This week, a small company called by the name of Nike signified their 30th anniversary with an ad narrated by a hardly known young man by the name of Colin Kaepernick. Ads come on TV all the time, but this one seems to have gotten quite a bit of attention. So much attention that it has garnered conversation from your house all the way to the White House. Talk Riolan. What is all the conversation about this ad? The ad is narrated by a man that dared to take a stand and say something not against the United States of America, not against the flag that the country stands behind. No, he, he said something about brutality and injustice. And for that, this talented, gifted, accomplished quarterback in the National Football League has been blackballed. You can feel however you want to feel about it. Here's what I know. He's better than over half of the quarterbacks playing this Sunday. <laughs> Nevertheless, he hadn't seen, hadn't seen a football field in over a year. And when society said that he was the underbelly, interesting, there's another fellow, no, no, no shade, I love Tim Tebow. It's another fellow that took a knee named Tim Tebow quite often. Folk thought he was praying, but what he was really doing was protesting some things about his faith that he didn't think his country stood for. Check me out, go read about it and you'll find out. He had an issue with the fact that abortion was illegal in America. So he took a knee in protest. But you didn't know that, did you? It is because when you control the economics, you control the narrative. This fellow by the name of Colin Kaepernick can't find any help on the football field, but Nike decided to lift him where everybody else left him. They, they took a chance, some people thought, in allowing him to narrate the 30th anniversary ad, and it was said that surely they would suffer greatly at at, at the register because of that, people throughout the country decided that they would go barefoot and burn their shoes. One genius, one genius put kerosene on his shoes, lit them on fire, and burned down his whole house. <laughs> Have mercy, Lord. What I appreciate, though, about Nike is, as I stated before, where everybody else left Colin, they lifted Colin, which is a reminder that sometimes we've got to have enough care for our brothers and sisters that when no one else will be there, 
We've got to show up for them. Nike's motto is just do it. But so often we get caught up in just talking about it. What I appreciate about Nike is they stood behind somebody that they had been with since 2011. And when it wasn't popular, they still did what was proper. And because of that, I wanted to check my facts because I know I passed the Union Branch Baptist Church. Nike sales are up 31% since the ad started. All I'm telling you is sometimes you've got to do what's not popular and be willing to be proper and just do it. That's, that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. Colin, Colin says this, and I quote, Believe in something, even when it means sacrificing everything. Preach, Colin. Thank you, sir. He goes on to say, don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. Which helps me understand that if my dreams aren't bigger than my capability, I'm not dreaming big enough. I want to talk to some students that just started school that dare to dream that you can have all A's. I, I want to talk to a business owner or a future entrepreneur to know that you can be a, a successful CEO. I want to talk to a family that's going through some hard trials to know that your whole family can be saved. And what I need you to understand is sometimes we got to stop talking about it Get off, I'll do nothing, do something, and just do it. Yeah. Tasha, the text this morning will help us understand that we can find many reasons not to do what needs to be done, but ultimately, there are times when we just need to do it. We can find every reason not to straighten out our closet, but you ought to just do it. You can find a lot of reasons not to clean the baseboards, but you ought to just do it. You can find a lot of reasons not to say I'm sorry, but you ought to just do it. You can make up a lot of excuses for why we don't tithe, but we ought to just do it. We can talk about how busy we are. We don't have time to read the Bible, but we ought to. Not going to trouble you long. Here we are in this second chapter of Mark. And it, 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 it depicts the life of a man named Jesus. We've been in Mark now. From Mark first chapter, we found out about how this man named Jesus was, was talked about by John the Baptist and how John made straightway the path for Jesus to show up. We found out in Mark chapter 1 that before his public ministry took effect, he, he was, he was uh, adorned with praise from on high. The Father in heaven spoke and said, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. That same Spirit drove Jesus into a barren wilderness where he was fasting and praying and tempted for 40 days and for 40 nights. But after the preparation of pain in the wilderness, Jesus begins to live up to whom he's been called to be. Can I just talk for a minute? Yes, and so as he begins to do what God has sent him to do, God, I wish I had time to tell somebody, slow down, don't be in such a hurry and let God finish preparing you. Because if you're not prepared when it's time, you'll, man you'll mismanage the moment. He was prepared to go and do the miracles of, of exercising demons out of people. He was prepared to deal with Peter's mother-in-law in her sick situation. He was prepared to handle when throngs of people wanted him to become king and he knew that there was already a king of kings and a lord of lords. And if you're not careful, you'll go out too early and you'll burn out before you can even get started. Second chapter, after having performed 
miracles and folk wanted him to hang around. Jesus had the wisdom to say, I need to leave here for a little while. The text says he comes back to Capernaum, which means he had to leave. He comes back to Capernaum and, and the Bible picks up in the second chapter and says that when he came back, he was at Peter and Andrews' house. We, we may shout at the end, but I need to teach you just for a second that he's at Peter and Andrews' house and, and there are throngs of people. And the people are there not because he's healing the sick. Paul, that's not why they're there. They're not there because he's turning water into wine. That's not why, they, why he's there. They, they, they're not there because he's making the lame to walk. No, according to the text, they're there because, wait for it, he's preaching the word. I didn't expect us to shout right there because we live in a dispensation of time where we need everything from church but the word. We need it to be relevant. We need it to be exciting. We need it to be inspirational. But when did the word stop being right? In the text, they showed up just to hear the word. They come to hear the word, and the Bible declares that there's a man in need. Here it is, Shauna. Riola, you say, just do it, but, but how? Uh, theoretically, it sounds good, but, but how? How do I know what to do, when to do, how to just do it? I believe the text will help us see three things very quickly. I'll get out of the way. First thing the text shows us is if you're going to just do it, you ought to do it compassionately. Paul, here, here's, here's what the text says. There's a paraplegic being carried by four men. Let me teach you. Uh, paraplegic suggests then that from the waist down, this man has no strength or no ability to walk. He, he, can't, he can't get where he needs to be on his own. He, he, he can't go anywhere. He can't go to the market. He, he can't go to Walmart. He can't go to social services. He can't even go to the temple to hear the word preached. But, but some folk carry him. Which, which messed with me for a minute, Coleman, because I started asking the question, why is he a paraplegic? Um, why, why must he be carried? Because the truth of the matter is, sometimes we see people being carried and wonder, how did they get there? Why, why they got to get an EBT card? Uh-huh. Well, why they need free lunch at school? Why, why we got to give to them um, um, in the benevolent fund? And, and can I suggest that it's human to ask those kinds of questions? All right. Right. Yeah. But maybe he's being carried because he can't help himself. Maybe there was nothing he did wrong. Maybe what he experienced that maybe some of you have never experienced is this very long, very complicated, a lot of syllable words called life. Maybe what happened to him was he had plans to do better, but couldn't do better. Maybe a divorce showed up. Maybe some sickness showed up. Maybe some heartbreak showed up. And I know there are many of us in here that have it all together but maybe somebody that we got our nose turned up at isn't lazy, isn't sinning, but life happened. They lost a spouse. They lost a mama or a daddy. They had some mental issues and couldn't find their way back. But thanks be to the people that won't just see
Don't worry. I can read like you read. I know Jesus is going to say your sins are forgiven. I know that's what he's going to say. But before you get too, too quick, you need to understand context. The context of the sinning is that all have sinned. Brandon, know who all includes? All includes the religious leaders outside in the front. All. All of us that don't have time to lend a shoulder to somebody that needs to cry. All. All of us that have arrived and, and we judge the sins of others. And if I had time, I'd tell you, the only reason you're not doing that sin anymore is because you can't. You'll catch that in the morning. <laughs> All, all that have had some fortunes that others haven't had. And, and all, all I'm trying to get at is, if, if we're going to be who God has called us to be, then he's called us to be it with some compassion. Yeah, I'm pushing on, but let me, let me go and get this out of the way. Uh, I understand for all... The A-type analytical folk that, un that, that know everybody else's issue. That's fine. But what we ought to do is just do what God said. What did he say, Riolan? He said, he said, thank you for feeding me. Thank you for clothing me. And his disciples said, when did we do that, sir? When you did it unto the least of them, you did it unto me. So if they're a fraud, he'll fix it. But I'm going to do what he called me to do so that I don't block my blessing. I'm moving. How do we just do it? We just do it compassionately. But secondly, <laughs> secondly, we ought to do it creatively. Watch the text. The text says that these four men take Jesus, take, take their friend the paralytic, the one that can't walk, they try to get him to Jesus. But Kayla, the problem is they can't get him through the front door. They can't get him through the front door because there's so many people that the doorway is blocked. I wish I had time because I'd ask a question, what's your door? What's the thing hindering you from getting where you need to be? Talking here, Riola, and I'm trying. What, 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 what's the issue that's prohibiting your progress? Because all of us have a door. Sometimes it's self-esteem. Sometimes it's self-imaging. Sometimes it's education. Sometimes it's the past that has given me great pain. But can I tell you, when you try to go through the front door that everybody else has blocked, you need some folk in your life that are creative enough that if they can't get you to the front door, they'll find another way. Can I tell you what they did in the text? They, they, they took him up on the rooftop. Boy, I wish y'all liked the Bible like I did. I, if, if you did, I tell you that, that in those days, a two-story house had a ladder on the side of the house. And, and it was because sometimes evening conversations would take place on the rooftop. If I had the right crowd, I'd tell you sometimes some husbands had to take a ladder and go up on the rooftop. That's a conversation for another day. You got to read your Bible to know what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, um, you could go up to the rooftop and, and get to the upper level. And the text says that when they couldn't get through the front door, they were creative enough to go up the ladder. And I want to pause right there to suggest that not only is that creativity, but it's persistence. And the question I have is, what is it that you're looking for that you're not willing to be persistent enough to get? Can I tell you, if you want God to move, you've got to learn to pray until something happens. You've got to be persistent enough to give until you get your breakthrough. You've got to be persistent enough 
to study until you get the grade you want. You've got to be persistent enough to love even when hate is coming back your way. You've got to be persistent enough to believe when the doctor's report says you shouldn't. And can I tell you that if those four people had stopped at the front door, this man would have missed his blessing. But I need some creative people to say if we can't get it done this way, we'll find another way. I won't get tired on you. I won't give up on you. But we'll make a way out of no way. Let me talk from my real life experience. Last week, I was in Kentucky preparing for Micah's ordination. And, and Reverend C was home and not feeling well. And, and she had a fever of 103. Fortunately, Rosie was there and we were trying to get an appointment, but, but, but if you've ever dealt with healthcare, sometimes it's a little difficult to get an appointment. So, so Reverend C has a cousin named Yvonne in Washington, D.C. She happens to be a doctor. She knew some stuff we didn't know. So she started making some phone calls. And the phone calls led to some more phone calls. And those phone calls led to a return phone call. They said, we don't have any appointments, but because we got a call from so-and-so, we're going to fit you in to come in. That ain't the shout. The shout is when she got there, she was in such a condition that the doctor said, you need to go to the emergency room. That ain't the shout. When she got to the emergency room, when they told her, we've got to admit you. You got here just in time. Because if you hadn't got here when you did, we can't tell you what the outcome would have been. But it wouldn't have been good. All I'm telling you is you got to learn to be creative and learn how to get to Jesus any way you need to. If you got to get to him in the morning, at noonday, late at night, in the break room, in the bathroom, in the living room, in your car, at the game, wherever you need to get to him, don't let nothing or nobody keep you from Jesus. Am I talking to anybody? They peel back the roof and let him down. Can I tell you what Michelle Obama says? When they go low, we go high. If the front door is blocked, find a way to go high. Look to the hill. Don't be coming here. Got to just do it. No more excuses. Just do it. How do you do it? You do it compassionately. You do it creatively. Finally, <laughs> you do it when you're gonna like this. You've got to do it Christologically. Don't worry, I'm coming to get you. It's just a 50 cent word for how you view Jesus. Uh, Deacon Edwards, it struck me that these four men carry their friend, the paraplegic who cannot walk for himself, yeah. to the front door, but they can't get there. And they take the effort. Listen, don't miss this. They didn't just climb the ladder. They carried him up the ladder. They cared enough, watch this, the text doesn't suggest that either of those four had an issue. Can you help somebody else when it's not going to help you? When, when you're not going to get a pat on the back, can you still help somebody else? Can you send a card to someone? When you're not sick,
talk Riolan. And, and the text helps me understand that they creatively did what they had to do, but it speaks volumes of their Christology, which means there's something they think about Jesus. They knew that if they could get this man who couldn't help himself to the son of God, they knew if they could get this man to Mary's baby, they knew if they could get this man to the rabbi, they knew if they could get this man to the one that they asked, can anything good come from Nazareth? They knew that something was going to happen. And my question is, what is your Christology? What do you believe about Jesus? Because if you really believe he's a healer, then with, when the symptoms still prevail, you'll rest on the fact that by his 39 lashes, you're already healed. If you believe he's a provider, then when you have more month than money, you know that God will make a way somehow. What do you believe about Jesus if you don't have bread in the house? If you really believe he's who he says he is, then you'll know that he's bread when you're hungry, water when you're thirsty, that he's a wheel in the middle of the wheel. And that's my question this morning, boy Saul. What do you believe about Jesus? I came to tell you, I believe he's a burden bearer and a heavy load sharer. I believe that he is my redeemer. I believe that he is a healer. I believe that he is a provider. I believe that he is a keeper. Do I have any believers in the house? You ought to sometimes just stand for what you believe. And I came to declare today, he still sits high and looks low. I got to leave y'all because it's time to go. But, but as I go, can I tell you, I've preached this before and the shout was, Jesus looks at the man, says, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, take up your mat and walk. And that's a good place to shout because what carried him, he's now carrying. Boy, I wish I had the right crowd to know that some of this stuff that's holding you down in due season, you're going to carry what used to carry you but that's not my shout anymore my shout this time here is when i looked at the text jesus says take up your mat and go what messed me up though is how is he going i know he can walk now but what caught me was he's not going back the way he came. He came being carried. He came being lowered, but he's leaving through the same door that blocked him from getting in. And when God brings you through, he's gonna let you walk through the door that had you blocked. If you believe that, you ought to do what they did in the text because when they saw him they said what manner of man can do this and they praised him for who he was where are the praisers that says he'll just do it i don't know when he'll do it i don't know how he'll do it i don't know where it's gonna happen but he can just do it he can do it on Friday. He can do it on Saturday. But he can do what nobody else can do. And get up with all power in his hand. Has he ever done it for you? Has he made a way? Has he touched your body? 
Has he blessed your baby? Shout yes! 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 There are a thousand reasons not to do it. But at some point, when the community doesn't do it, when, when the commonwealth doesn't do it, when the country doesn't do it, the church ought to be willing to do it. Do what, pastor? Get people to Jesus. I'm going to say it till y'all get tired of hearing me say it. It's not enough for us to come in here and have church. He didn't save us to sit. He saved us to share. And I don't want to have to stand before him and answer the question, after all I did, why didn't you tell somebody? Just do it. I'm done. Some of y'all have made the mistake of asking me to be your friend on Facebook. <laughs> so I know you don't have any problem expressing your opinion. If you can talk about how you feel about everything else, every now and then, we ought to tell somebody about this Jesus we love. Amen, lights. Come on, we're standing all over the building. Sometimes, Delivery, charisma is mis misinterpreted. Let me be clear. It's not about beating up on any of us. It's about encouraging all of us to be compassionate, to be creative, but most of all, to never forget the importance of Christ. He's got to be our all in all, and out everything. So, if you've never allowed him to be that, just do it. Just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is who he says he is. Just do it. Take a step of faith, a leap of faith, and walk out into the aisle and say, I need to be saved. While you're contemplating that, maybe there's somebody else that's tired of being mediocre. You're tired of not living up to what you got saved for. You're, you're saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, but you and the Lord ain't really rocking with one another right now. Come on back to God. He's waiting for you. He's not, he's not mad, he's not judging. That's what we do, that's not what he does. He's full of grace and mercy. Is there one today that wants to recommit themselves back to the Lord? While that's being contemplated, maybe there's somebody else that the Lord is speaking to your heart about being connected to this body of baptized believers called Union Branch Baptist Church. You need a church home and God is sending you here to be nurtured, to be loved, to be cared for. Is there one today? Bless the Lord. If she was, if she was a lottery winner, we'd be tearing these walls down. She's coming back to Christ. Somebody ought to give God praise. Is there another? Salvation. Recommittal. Pastor, what that mean when I recommit? I can't. I can't. Or... Or, I can't even 
It's not about what you can do. It's what you can do. You can trust and believe in the Lord. He'll handle all that other stuff. Salvation, recommittal, membership. You can be seated. We're we going, but this is what we show up for. We show up to help somebody. Oh, come on. Have mercy, God. Have mercy, God. Have mercy. There's a lifting of the hand. There's a lifting of a heart. There's a lifting of the eyes beyond the hill to where our help comes from. So there's a lifting of the hand. There's a lifting of the heart. There's a lifting of the eye beyond the hill to where our help comes from. All help comes from you, Lord. All help comes from you. All help comes from you, God. Beyond the hill to where I help come from. Afternoon, church. We'd like to welcome Natasha Varon. She's from Marion, South Carolina. She's coming on Christian Experience. And we'd also like to welcome Daryl Darrell, excuse me, Darrell Stiff. He's also coming on Christian Experience. Y'all excuse my back for just a minute. Let me say very quickly, on behalf of the entire congregation, how excited we are to have you all to come be a part of the City of Hope. We don't take it for granted you could be anywhere else in a day and time when allegedly millennials are going away from the church, you're coming to the church and we give God praise for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. So just want to ask you a couple quick questions. Are you willing to give of your time, talent, and treasure in the life of this church as the Lord would give unto you? Yeah, yeah. You willing um, to, to, yeah. You, you willing to love Jesus Christ? Yeah, that's all. That's all. We, don't, we don't need to do nothing else. If y'all are willing to do that, then we're willing to love you, to care for you, to teach and to preach, and to walk this this life of Christianity together. And whatever we can do to make your stay uh, better, we look forward to. You already have made yourself at home. That's a, that's a worshiper there, y'all. She ain't scared. <laughs> Natasha, Brother Stiff, we like to welcome you to the City of Hope. Come on, family. Let's thank God for these young folks. 